singing this song, I just kept hearing this declaration from God, and I just want to declare it and release it, but I just declare that encounters are coming. That's what I heard from heaven, that we have to make room for the encounters from heaven. They're coming to our home. They're coming to our workplace. They're coming to our school, to our classrooms. I just begin to see these encounters taking place in the classroom. But the Lord says, declare that encounters are coming, but we have to make room. And the way we make room is we have to stay postured because we are the encounter. And we have to stay in a place that we are just positioned with him. And so I just declare that and release that. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So if God wants to meet with us and he wants to encounter us, we have to make room for that. Amen. And uh, he wants to do it. And we want him to, but sometimes we just have to say, God, do it. Here I am. We make ourselves available. Amen. Praise God. We give him permission. Uh, I love what one of the things that I've heard Heidi Baker pray many times. Lord, crash in. Lord, crash in in our lives. Amen. Praise God. Well, we welcome you today. It's good to have all of you with us. Thank you, Colton. And if she is able, Jamie's going to come and make a few announcements before we take an offering. So come on up. I am able. Amen. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a big week. Um, thank you guys for praying for my dad. After we left last Sunday, he got to go home from the hospital. So um, he's increasing in strength. His blood count is coming up. And um, it's good news. He called to check on me this week. And <laughs> he's like, do you want me to come over there? I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Stay where you are. Uh, I know. I know. It's like he's like, "Are you are you scared? Do you want me to come over there?" I'm like, "What are you going to do?" You know? I can take you down right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, he's doing well. So, um lots of birthdays today. Miss Carrie, who isn't here, her sister had an emergency heart kind of thing, I think today happening and so that was very unexpected of course and so I'm sure that's where she is today but if you see her on Facebook tell Miss Carrie happy birthday. Cashton is 10 today and Damon is 40 something today not 10 right 10 times something right so happy birthday guys anyone else have a birthday this week anything Andy and I were talking this morning on the way to church how when we remember being raised in the Baptist church, how you had to go up when it was your birthday and put the coins in the little house. It was so exciting. It's like, we should do that again, right? Isn't that fun? Everybody has to bring their coins to put in on your birthday. Anyone remember those days? All of us. Yeah. All of us back. I don't know. Did other denominations do that? Yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Anyway, um, so tomorrow, Supernatural School will continue tomorrow night at 6.30, and the topic is the School of Deliverance. So um, Andy usually gets home, leaves here at 9 o'clock on Monday nights. This last Monday night, he's texting me, sorry, manifestations, people's demons everywhere. He really didn't. He, but <laughs> it was Lisa. No, no. no. He was a little later because he had to pray for a lot of extra people, but, you know, that's good, right? We're getting free. And then next, yes, next Monday, um, Ziggy Sanchez will be at um, GHSSM. And don't you want to come just because his name is Ziggy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested just because, you know. And then February 1st is the Men's Breakfast Fellowship, and that'll be here, right? We don't know. We'll let y'all know. We'll let you know. Just mark your calendar February 1st. And tomorrow, our school, um, you can eat at Panda Express. And our school gets the pro some of the proceeds from that. So have your lunch and your dinner there. It start, it's all day long. And make sure you tell them um, that you're with us. Last time, they're like, show this paper or show your digital thing from Facebook or something like that. But they're like, it's fine. Just tell us you're with Global Harvest Christian School. And they just 
bring it up that way and they give proceeds to us. I wanted, how much did we make last time? Like 600 or something? Yeah. Which they gave us extra. They gave us 50% instead of 20% last time. So that was really, really cool. And we can do that once a month and we haven't, but we're probably going to because, you know, y'all going to eat something anyway. So um, make it Panda Express tomorrow a couple of times. Tell all your coworkers, to, you know. It's, it's, yeah, it's decent food. Yeah. So I'm out. All right. All right. It's an easy fundraiser, right? Yes. All right. Well, let's take an offering. Uh, let's stand together as we take an offering and make our <laughs> offering declaration. Um, you can always give online at globalharvestchurch.co. If you want to make sure that you're getting credit for giving for tax purposes, we're starting a new year. And uh, make sure that you give in an envelope so that we have a record of cash giving. So let's make this declaration together today. As we receive today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions. Favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ Hallelujah. Amen. And we don't pass a plate. We just bring that and give in the offering chest here. So thank you for your faithfulness in giving, your generosity, and it just enables us just to keep doing what the Lord has asked us to do. So thank you for that. God is faithful. Thank you for being faithful. Amen. Praise God. God is good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Also remember looking ahead, uh, and we created an event for this, but I'll give more details in the days ahead. Ian Carroll will be with us the weekend of February 21st, and that is going to be a very, very powerful time. So I'm expecting God to do a lot of things through Ian. Amen. Now at this time, we're dismissing the kids to go to their program, sixth grade and under, I believe, and... uh, as they go, and God meets them, and God just does good things. We're thankful for all our workers, our children's church and nursery, and as they are training laborers. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Some are more excited than others. It's all good, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> So this morning, wow, if you didn't listen to last Sunday's message, I encourage you to find that on SoundCloud, on YouTube, um, and listen to that, because that was very uh, um, specific about some prophetic things that God had been saying over the last months uh, of what He wanted to do in this upcoming season. So um, I want to look at that, because this morning I'm, I'm preaching a message basically because I had, wow, I need to adjust this a little bit. I I had an encounter very early Monday morning, and I'll talk I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, encounters with the Lord and encounters with angelic beings those are very very real, and they're very scriptural, right? I mean, a few weeks ago I, I taught on dreams and how God meets people in dreams and speaks through dreams and. And we know that um, Joseph, even in the, in the nativity story, encountered angels several times in what appeared to be a dream realm, okay? So when I start talking about mystical encounters, sometimes people are like, oh, wait a minute, you're, you're getting out there. But the reality is that is extremely scriptural, okay? And uh, you can go back and listen to that teaching again. But one of the words that that Abner Suarez gave us in November, and he gave us many words, I talked about many of those last Sunday, was that he said that he began to see beautiful notes in this place, and that he began to hear the sounds of heaven going forth from this room into all the earth. 
and that uh, it was the sound of 24-7 worship. Now, those things scare me because 24-7 worship and prayer um, takes a lot of effort, right? And uh, uh, there's a lot involved in that, but that there was a sound that he was hearing from heaven that needed to be sung and needed to be declared out of this place. Amen. So early, early Monday morning, I had this dream, and I call it a dream, though sometimes my dreams are more, I go places in the Spirit, okay? And I don't know how to explain that. I've had dreams before and shared it with other prophets, and they're like, that wasn't a dream, that was an encounter that you went into. So I'm not going to tell the whole encounter because it involves um, another prophet, it involves some things that I saw. Uh, but in my dream, there was this, this woman that came to me, and I believe the woman was actually an angelic being. And um, she's very beautiful. She had long, dark hair. Uh, she came to me, and um, someone introduced me. There was a gr- big group of people, and she said, they said, this is, her name is Song, S-O-N-G, and said she has traveled with Charlie Champ, on many of his international trips, and we want you to meet her. And so she came and met me. We talked about international trips that I had been on. I dreamt some other things that had to do with Charlie, and those are private things, and I shared them with Charlie, and he's like, oh, my gosh, your dream is astounding. Um, but I, I, I had that dream and that encounter early mor- Monday morning, and all day I just felt like I was in another realm. I told Jamie several times, I said, I'm sorry that I seem very disconnected because I'm not sure that I'm here. And I just kind of lived in that encounter all day. And I really felt like, and even when we went into chapel for Global Harvest Christian School on Monday morning, there was a very, very different presence, okay? There was something, because how many times, you know, there's, there's a difference between sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit but then all times you also at times, and I don't know how to explain this other than just using your spiritual senses, you feel the presence of angelic beings, okay? And I was very aware, and I looked at Jamie, and I said, that angel that I dreamt about is here. And that angel has come here for this season because there is a specific assignment that that angelic being named Song has come to bring to this place, right? There's something further that the Lord is wanting to impart to us and release in us and through us in this house. Now, if an angel named Song shows up, we need to pay attention, especially if you're a worshiper, if you're on the worship team. There is an angel named Song that, I know it's risky talking about this, Because some of you are like, yeah, and some of you are like, I don't know about that, right? But there's an angel named Song that's come to release the sounds and the worship of heaven in this place. Amen. And because there's something that God wants to do. Abner saw it. Other people have seen it. Uh, Other people have prophesied about it for years. We've known that there's something that God further wants to do through worship and prayer in this region. Now, if God wants to do something like that, it should be no surprise that there's a war, there is a war yes, over worship. Yes, there's a war over musicians. There's a war over worshipers. There's a war over intercessors, right? If you've been an, if you're called to be an intercessor and we all are called to be intercessors to varying degrees, but there's a war often over your life. I mean, I know in our own intercessory team, over the last months and weeks and years, we've seen a lot of strikes against them, against their family, against different things. But there's a war. So be aware today that as I'm preaching this message, um, that there is a, not only a war, but there is a call, and there is a grace, and there is an angelic being that has come alongside you to strengthen you to step into what God has called you to do in this season because God's calling us up higher, right? He's calling the the purposes and the destiny for not only families and individuals and churches, but destinies for regions, 
destinies for states, right? He's calling those things into manifestation and into being. So this morning as, as we're doing this, as we're declaring this, and, and we know that, that angels are ministering spirits sent for the benefit of those who've inherited salvation, right? Angels aren't just some fat baby playing a harp, eating bonbons on a cloud. They've been sent from the presence of God to bring things in the people of God's lives into fulfillment, right? So let's talk about that this morning. Hallelujah. The Lord's commissioning you guys. So first of all, I just kind of want to lay a foundation of presence, okay? Um, So you guys do realize that we live under an open heaven, right? There's an open heaven that we live under. Now, it's very interesting because, you know, um, and, and I've prayed this prayer, and I know a lot of other intercessors have prayed it over the years, but, you know, out of Isaiah 64, and we're not going to turn there because there's other things we want to look at, but Isaiah, one of the things that he prayed was that God would rend the heavens and come down. Okay, it was a prophetic thing that he declared. Now, Isaiah was seeing something that has happened now in our lives, right? He saw a reality that he was prophesying and calling forth that we now live in because we live under an open heaven. Now, when Jesus was baptized in water, the heavens opened, right? Let's look at that. Let's turn to Mark chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Let's turn there. And Jesus began something with his life and his ministry that was to be a reality for all of us. Who wants to live under an open heaven? We should want that. Do you guys ever hear people say stuff like, oh my gosh, our city is the hardest? Right? Everybody says that. Oh, Ardmore is so bad. Or, well, brother, you've never lived in Love County. (laughs) <laughs> right, <laughs> or that, or oh my gosh, Hilton is the armpit of the earth. <laughs> right, you know, or man, you don't know what it's like to live in Sulphur or Medill. You know, everybody, you know, has all those. Th- and and I'm not saying that those regions and cities don't have challenges. They do, you know. But the reality is we as the people of God, we live yes. under an open heaven. Yes. And there, there's a reality of an open heaven that we are not only to live under, but that we're to release through our lives, right? Maybe if there's more that needs to change in our city, maybe it's because we as the people of God don't understand what's been given us, and not only what's been given us, but what we have the responsibility to live in and release through our lives individually and corporately. Amen. Because we're people of His presence. So Jesus began something. The the Father did something through Jesus. And it says here in Mark 1, verses 10 through 11, Jesus is baptized And it says, and immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening. Suddenly, the heavens are open in a new way to Jesus. And the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens saying, "Um, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So there's this reality of, of, of what God had promised began happening in Jesus, right? He became a tabernacle or a dwelling place of the Spirit, okay? And now that same word for um, uh, of the heavens being opened, of them being rent, the word opening means to cleave, it means to split, and it means to tear, and it's very violent. So... It's the same word that when Jesus was crucified, the temple veil was rent in two from top to bottom. It was violently ripped open, and the presence of God, which had always remained behind a veil, for a high priest to only go in once a year, suddenly 
we all gained access. Right? At that moment, access to God by His Spirit, by His presence, became open. Right? Jesus paid the price. Amen? You can have as much of God in this moment as you want. Right? It's available. Right? And so we have that reality. Now, so we've got the man, Jesus Christ, clothed with heaven at this moment, thoroughly equipped for all he was called to do in the earth. You realize he became a forerunner for how you're supposed to live and how you're supposed to walk, right? He was a man. He was fully God. He was fully man. But he lived as a man, equipped by the Holy Spirit to, do, to live a certain way. And that became a foretaste of what would soon be available to everyone, right? So what happens next? Now, let's talk about the presence of God. Now, I hear sometimes people, and we're talking about God's presence and God coming and all those things, and I hear sometimes people debate, debate, why should we invite God when He's already here? Right? Anybody ever hear that? Anybody ever argue that? Yeah. Why should we do that? And I, there, there, we have to understand there are different measures and dimensions of God's presence, right? And, uh, you know, I, I really like, and this is something that Bill Johnson says when he talks about out of Isaiah 61, right, in, in verse 1. And Isaiah had this encounter with the Lord, and he said, I saw the Lord with the train of his robe filling the temple. And he said the word filling implies that his robe filled the temple, but then continued to fill it, okay? Anybody ever get married where you have a long train, yeah. right? Anybody ever see a royal wedding, yeah. you know, where the princess is coming in and she's got this long train. She's got all these little kids carrying the train, right? Because she'd be walking like this, right? But... There's this reality that God is present, but He's coming, and He's here, but He keeps coming. Amen. Here's the reality. No matter what there is of God in your life or in a region or in a church or whatever, there is always more. No matter what you've experienced, and most people, I, I'm just going to be honest, I've seen people that say, well, God's here, so we don't need to ask anything more. Some of those people are the driest people I've ever seen in my life. Some of the driest, most messed up people, right? I think we just need to ask for more. And people that I've seen that ask for more have had some of the most fruitful, most effective, most powerful lives. Because sometimes if we think we have everything and we're not seeking more, we get arrogant and prideful. And what does God resist? Right? So we need to understand what we have but we need to press in for the more because there's always more. Now, let's talk for just a minute because some of the measures of his presence, and where I'm going with this is that on the day of Pentecost, suddenly all these dimensions of God's presence came together, right? And so, first of all, we know that God's omnipresent. He's here, right? We know that He's present. We know that God is here and that He holds all things together by the power of His being, by the word of His being. He holds all those things together. Amen? And yet we know that He indwells the believer and makes us His tabernacle. Yeah. Right? That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Suddenly, we became the tabernacle of God when the Holy Spirit came. Yeah. Right? You're a walking tabernacle filled with glory, right? But did you know that there's more glory that we can get? You know how, you know how something's full? How do you know something's full? It runs over, right? So if you're full and you're walking around as a tabernacle of glory, that glory that's in you, it's going to get off on everybody else. Right? There's a glory that's going to spill over. You're going to splash other people. 
right? Even this morning when Betty, at, in our prayer time, she was talking about the angelic, I was very aware that there was this angelic being in front of her. And he was just waving glory on her. He was just waving glory on her, right? And that, that light of his presence, right? Did you feel that? Did you sense that? Yeah, yeah, you know. She's, who, who, I, I, I want to be full, right? There's a river of living water that he wants to pour out of us, right? And the thing is, if you pour out, don't you love the, the scriptural thing that says, give and it shall be given? You know, there's a principle, and we'll probably talk about this more of days ahead. Anything that you give out gets multiplied in greater measure back to you. Thank you, Lord. Right? Now, preachers and pastors like to use that in reference to offering. It's true. But if we give the glory of God and we begin to release it, guess what God starts doing? He starts giving more. He's like, oh, they're good stewards of my presence. Oh, they're pouring presents out. Let me give them more, right? What we give out always gets multiplied in greater measure. That's why it's so important that we walk in forgiveness. Because when you walk in forgiveness, it releases God's blessing, right? The flip side of that is also true. I didn't mean to preach the sermon, but it's right here, right? What we give out, also what you reap, you sow. And the reality is that God meant that to be a blessing to us. But when we start doing things like releasing gossip, strife, judgment, that gets given back too. So you have to be very, it got real quiet then. Nobody was like doing a glory run around the church. Woo, I'm reaping gossip. Woo, right? <laughs> because the, <laughs> those are principles that God designed to bless us. Amen. And so when we become people that give out of his presence, amen, of his glory, then God's like, man, I just, they're, they're a tabernacle. I just want to let that flow through their lives. Amen. He indwells us as a temple and he makes us his tabernacle. Now, there's also the reality that he's present in a greater dimension when we gather together. Right? Let's read that. Let's read Matthew 18, 20. Just, I think it's important to understand this. It says, for where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Did you know there's a greater dimension of God's presence when you gather with a gathering of the saints? Now, sometimes I see people say, well, the Lord's called me to leave the church. Sorry, that's not scriptural, right? There's a greater dimension of God's glory when we gather as his body and his name. Amen. How many of you want exponential I increase? I want that. We were just talking about that. Part of that is when we gather, there is a greater release of His glory. Amen. So that's another dimension of His presence. Amen. Now, there's also a greater dimension of His presence that occurs when people praise Him. Right? It says that, you know, and, and that he inhabits the praises of his people. Psalm 22, 3, right? I mean, we heard Charlie Shamp one time when he was with us. And Charlie said that he saw literally in the spirit uh, the throne of God. And he said, I believe the throne of God moves. Amen. And he said, when there's praise in a region, he said, there's an element of God's lordship and his throne that comes and settles in that place. Now, I don't know how God does that. I don't know. He can probably be a lot more places than once because He's omnipresent. But there's something about when praise is released that His throne, and He said, it's, he said I saw His throne and it was mobile. And it was looking for regions where it could come and settle because of the praises of His people. Right? I want the throne of God to be enthroned in my life. I want the throne of God to be 
enthroned in this place. Because that's when we, we begin to experience that Shekinah glory. That dwelling presence that isn't just a visitation, but it's a habitation of His glory. I mean, I've heard reports of people saying that when you still go to places like South Africa, because of the things that Andrew Murray did and taught and ministered in South Africa, there's a, there's a presence still that marks those places, right? You go to places where there's been revival or, or there's been awakening or there's been some type of intercession or healing that's been poured out. Those places are marked by presence and by the throne of God and the glory of God. I want to live in that, right? I, I want people when they drive by Ardmore on I-35 not to say, man, there's something going down there in a bad way, but I want them to say, oh my gosh, there's something of glory and there's something of presence that's marking that city, amen, amen. And, and, and the Lord's looking for people who will worship and he'll say, kingdom come. God, come. You're here, but come. Dethrone the principalities and the things that have tried to rule. Lop off their head. Lop off their head, right? Take off that head. Right? It's what church tradition and history, it's not in the Bible, but in Ephesus, and we talked about the Ephesian revival in Acts 19, where um, Artemis, right, that temple, one of the great wonders of the world, and the Ephesus being a center of idol worship, when the church began to grow and become enthroned, and God began to become enthroned in that region, that there came a point where the head of that statue literally fell off. Now, we get all excited about that, but there's a principle, too, that when, when things start getting dethroned, there have to be kingdom people that lift up God's government, that have to establish presence of God in a region that actually begins to cause a shift, because if we don't do that, just another principality will try to come in and reign in a region, because what does Scripture say? If, you, if, you, if a devil goes out, if a spirit goes out and gets cast out and it comes back searching and finds something swept and unoccupied and it comes in and brings seven spirits worse than itself, it's worse, the condition of that person becomes worse. I think that's true of a region. And I think we're in a moment where there are some things that have been dethroned in our region. But the people of God must raise up worship, intercession, and God's government to see the greater manifestation of the glory of God come in a region. Right? Hallelujah. I'm just preaching all over the place today. I'm sorry, y'all. There's also, also that reality, and we talked about the Shekinah glory, but where a greater dimension of His presence occurs when people begin to praise Him. And, uh, you know, it happened in the, when they dedicated Solomon's temple. And the, the, the cloud of His presence came in in such measure and such a manifestation that it said the priest could not stand to minister. There was such a glory. Amen. You know, people are like, well, show me in the Word where people fall out under the presence of God. Well, there's one right there in the Old Testament, right? That's in um, 1 Kings chapter 8, right? And if there's that kind of glory in the Old Testament, how much more glory should we have under this covenant? When the people of God aren't just gathering around a presence in a temple, but we're all a tabernacle. And where we all, we're all being built as living stones into a temple of His presence. And when we get together, there's all this presence and there's all this glory and there's all this mixture of all these anointings and all this presence that come together, right? If one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight, what happens when glory-filled believers come together united around the presence and purposes of God? 
there's exponential increase. And so all of these things came together on the day of Pentecost, right? And suddenly there was this, this outpouring, and we're going we're gonna to look at this more in a minute, but you've got all these believers. And we know that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people from, from his resurrection to his ascension over 40 days. And he appeared to them and said, hey, you need to gather. I'm going to do something, that which I promised I'm going to pour out. And so 120 out of the 500, right? Because people probably had, to jo- had jobs, right? I don't know. <laughs> but there were 120 that gathered. Don't miss the day of your visitation, right? Don't miss the day of your visitation. But they gathered together, and there was this manifest presence of God that began to be poured out. Because here's the thing, all, all of life, all of Christianity can really get reduced to one thing. How do we steward the presence of God? Right? How do we steward the presence of God that He's given us? So let's look at that. I want to look at Psalm 27, 4. Great, it was such a great scripture. <coughs> Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord. How many of you have just asked one thing from God? Do we ask more than one thing from God? <laughs> right? Every day. Right? But the psalmist, and this is a psalm of David, he said, One thing have I asked from God. One thing I seek. Right? One thing, the primary thing above all other things, and this, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. He's like, I, there's just one thing I want, God. It's you. It's to dwell in your courts. It's to know your presence. <laughs> if that's not the one thing that we're seeking, we may be disappointed in eternity. Right? Because you know what heaven really is all about? The presence of God. Being in his presence, dwelling in his courts, beholding his beauty, knowing him throughout eternity. And if, if that's a scary thought or a thought that we're like, I don't know that I want that, we may not be born again. Because the one thing that we're per- to pursue and steward in our lives is the presence of God. Right, Whether you're the worship team, because sometimes we're like, oh, that's the worship team's job. No, it's our job as the people of God. We're all called to worship, and we're all called to steward the presence of God. Amen. So here's what happens. 120 believers together in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, you know, now, when you read this, isn't it funny? And you're like, the Holy Spirit gets poured out, crazy things start happening, and the whole city, and of course, there are people from all over who've come for the Feast of Pentecost, right? Because y'all, Pentecost didn't start in Acts chapter 2, <laughs> right? It was a feast, and so, you know, all these people have come to Jerusalem for the feast, and suddenly... Something happens and the, there's this outpouring and the whole city rushes together to see what's going on. Now, I, you know, some people, especially if you have a Pentecostal background, you probably just thought it was because everybody was screaming in tongues. Because <laughs> you're like, oh, suddenly 120, they're all, they're all praising God in languages that they didn't know. Right, But it's interesting because, you know, you've got people who've come from all over to Jerusalem, and they're all speaking in different languages anyway. Jerusalem's already this, this as much as could happen at that time, an international city. But something happens where everybody gathered to see what was up, right? 
So let's look at that. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 2. And in this moment, that which Jesus had introduced as a forerunner suddenly became available to every believer, right? And Pentecost really was all about first fruits, y'all, right? Suddenly, the first fruits that had been seen in Jesus, suddenly the harvest comes in. Right, And what was promised suddenly becomes available to everyone. Now, you could probably teach on Pentecost a lot better than I just did, but that's just a tiny snippet of it. So Acts 2.2, 2. let's read verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Now, it's interesting because everybody's like, this, this wind came out of heaven. Yes, but there was a noise of a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And it says in verse 3, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. So they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they got baptized in fire. Right? But I think it's really interesting what happened was there was a roar that came out of heaven. And it was so powerful and it was so um, loud and it so shifted the atmosphere that the whole city gathered to see what was up. The sound, the presence, the glory of God. And suddenly... A city that had crucified Jesus just weeks before suddenly gathered and said, what must we do to be saved? Is that a shift of an atmosphere? Now, Peter had to preach the gospel, right? I'm not discounting that because with presence there must come the gospel message. There must come a declaration and there must come a demonstration. Amen. But there's this reality that that it caused a shift of an atmosphere. And God, on the day of Pentecost, reintroduced the purpose for humanity that had been lost. That we would be baptized in His presence baptized in His glory. And not only baptized in His presence and His glory, but we become people who stirred what He's given and begin to release His presence and His glory all throughout the earth. And didn't God say, here I come, boys and girls. I'm filling Jerusalem. And if you study church history, the apostles went all over the earth sharing the gospel message, right? Laid down their lives, all of them martyred, except for one, John, right? Who they tried to martyr and couldn't because God still had things for to reveal to him. Now, if, if, if the gospel message didn't demand a response and didn't demand that we go and stirred his presence then why did these guys go and risk their lives to die? Right? Because they knew that it was important and a priority, a life-giving priority to take the gospel message to the nations. And they were all martyred in places, church tradition says, like India and England and all of these places because they'd been commissioned to go and not only take the gospel, but become those who carry the presence of God that they'd been baptized and stirred it to the very ends of the earth. Right? That's what Pentecost was all about. But the city gathered because there was a sound of heaven that got released. Right? There was a roar out of heaven that got released. And you know, this roar of heaven called Jerusalem back to its its original purpose. 
right? Because of King David, Jerusalem had become a city known for the presence of God. It was the place where David set up his tabernacle and worship happened around the, the, the Ark of the Covenant 24-7. And when that presence and that worship was combined and released, David, the, the kingdom transitioned from David, who was a man of war, into Solomon's rule that was one of the greatest the earth had ever known. And it transitioned because of worship, prayer, and presence. Right? Now, it was a transition. It, it didn't change overnight. And, you know, I wish, and we've been on this journey, how, how the church is, what, 11, 11 and a half years old? And I, I know that it's not just us. There are many other churches and ministries in this city. But in the last decade... There's been a war over presence. And there's been this thing where like, God, we're just coming into a region. We're coming in and we're building up presence in a region. We're establishing presence of God in a region because it's the one thing. It's the one thing we have to seek. Now, I know there are other good things that we have to do. I think I love what God's doing in the Christian school and the supernatural school. And, you know, there are times that things that are so important like fellowship and teaching, those are all such important dimensions. But the thing that has to be established primarily in a region is the presence of God. The manifest glory of God that comes in. And there are times that God will do this in a region because the people say, Lord, we're just giving ourselves to this. Some of you remember when uh, Church on the Rock in the 80s blew up in Rockwell, Texas with Larry Lee? Right? I heard reports about people pulling into the parking lot and running to get inside the building. They were so hungry. There was a presence of God. Right? Places like Reading, where Bethel is, and and iris bases in Mozambique. There there are places of presence that God wants to manifest His glory in His presence in a region, right? Places like Moravian Falls, right, that are still marked there in North Carolina with presence. And God begins to shift something, but it, it becomes the one thing that happens when the roar of God comes in. And the roar of God came in to Jerusalem. And that city that had been initially known as a place of His presence, it restored. to because And when God does something, doesn't He always make it better than it was before? Isn't that the, the awesome thing about restoration? When God wants to restore something, He doesn't just do it to where it was at the pinnacle in the past. He surpasses that and makes it even greater. Amen. And Jerusalem was restored from not only the city of King David and Solomon and one of the greatest places in the earth, but suddenly it became a place of His Shekinah glory. And the church blew up. The glory of God. That same sound of heaven that caused, that brought in with the Holy Spirit, that invasion... Uh, suddenly there was this glory of God that daily people were added to the church. People started getting saved every day. They were added to the church. There was a fear of the Lord on the whole city and the whole region. And it began to transform and people started getting discipled. And it was so good that no one wanted to leave. That's a whole other message that's been preached before, right? No one wanted to leave until finally God brought persecution just so they'd be scattered and go preach somewhere else. Right? It's like, y'all, I know that my glory is good, but the reality is you're called to steward the one thing. Right? Jerusalem is great, okay? But you take what I've given you 
and you go and you penetrate other dark places and you rescue people out of hell and destruction and you rescue people out of uh, the dark place that they're in and you begin to release my kingdom and you begin to release healing and you begin to release deliverance and you begin to release prosperity and you begin to release my word and my glory and you cause the glory of God to begin to spread throughout the earth. Amen. And it's all about the one thing. The presence and the glory of God. Hallelujah. Now, how does that sound of heaven come? Is it random? Does God just go, you know, I picked this place. Boom. I'm just going to fall in here. Well, he can do that. But who's, who's the gate of heaven? Right? Don't have time to read it, but Genesis 28, right? Jacob has this encounter where he sees that ladder coming out of heaven, angels ascending and descending. And he said, man, God was in this place and I didn't even know it. And he's trying to gain access. This is the house of God. First reference to church, the church, the people of God in Scripture. This is the gate of heaven. You and I are a gate. You and I are a gate. We live in both worlds. Man, I felt like it Monday. I'm not sure where I was all day. I was just like, Jamie talked to me and I'd just be like, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I feel so disconnected because I was like, I'm here but I'm not here. Right? It was just another Monday, really. You guys feel like on Monday? I'm still in the weekend. (laughs) But we're the gate of heaven. And so our call is to live in a realm of heavenly things. To live according to what the Word says. To live in fellowship with Jesus. And all those things. But to begin to pull that heavenly reality not only into my life, we do it first for us. And we do it for our family. Right? But we don't stop right there. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's great, but Joshua failed. Moses raised up a Joshua, but Joshua didn't raise anybody up. Right? Right? Because we begin to access a heavenly reality, not only for us, for our family, but wherever we go. Our church, our jobs, our offices, our region. Sometimes when stuff tries to come into our region, you know what? Sometimes we get mad. Wow, that shouldn't be here. Okay, well, you're the gate. And if... We spent, as the people of God, nearly as much time in intercession and in worship as we did griping on the Rants and Raves page. (laughs) If we said that we were praying as much as everybody on the scanner page did, praying, no, you're not. Our, Our city would probably begin to shift because... We're the people of God. We're the gate of heaven. And so the presence of God comes in because we're we're bringing it in. We're ushering Him in. That's why when we're gathering together on a Sunday morning, it's not just about singing a song. Right? It's about God. We're the people of God. We're the gate In a region. We're the house of God, and our worship is bringing a heavenly reality. It's not just affecting us, but Lord, man, you're starting to affect our neighborhood. You're starting to touch our city, right? You're starting to shift something, and many prophets, two or three, have said there's something about this 50 mile radius that we're living in, that God's touching a 50-mile radius through us. I think that's a promotion. I think there are other promotions that God wants to give us where He wants to go beyond 50 miles. 
But that's where we are right now. And it's, it's interesting to me that we just continue to pull people from all around the area. We got people coming from all these different cities, more than we actually do Ardmore. It's kind of weird, right? But there's something that's happening. And so these 120 people on the day of Pentecost, they came together and they began to lift up worship and they began to lift up prayer and they began to believe and they began to study the Word of God and they began to study, uh, as, as tradition tells us, on the day of Pentecost, they would study the things of God's power and they would study those things and they begin to, they probably begin to share about revivals that came out of the Old Testament because they had an expectation of what God wanted to do and they began to believe for those things and and they were in unity, and I'm not talking about watered-down unity. They were in unity around the purpose of God and around the presence of God. They just didn't all get together in a room and say, Well, I don't believe this, and I know you do, so I'm not going to do this. No, they were around the presence of God. And around the purposes of God and a sound of heaven. What? When you can potentially die, all the flakes are gone, Will says. That's a whole nother sermon too. <laughs> right. <laughs> this glory came. This presence came. And everyone in the city heard it. There was a sound of heaven that begin to be released. And I believe that that angel has come to facilitate the sounds of heaven. I believe that angel has come to facilitate a move of God because that worship, well, easy there, will begin to, to break something further open. Right? So I believe that angel's present today, overseeing what God wants to do. And I believe that angel is present along with other angels. We know that there are other angelic beings here. And we don't worship them, y'all. So don't be like, oh, they're worshiping angels over there at that church. No. But they're partnering. They've come from the presence of God to oversee what God wants to do. There's an angel of awakening that's been here a long time. Some of you have seen it. Other prophets have come in and seen it. Other intercessors. But there's an angel of awakening that's come in. And there, how, don't you love that I'm seeing a new angel come in? Because that means reinforcements are coming. That means there's a new thing that's coming in. There's a new dimension of God's presence that wants to bring something in. And there are sounds of heaven that are to be sang, played, decreed, that will come out of this house and go all over the earth. Right? Ryan Lestrange prophesied that, that we would decree a thing and it would affect the state of Oklahoma. Right? Worship team, there's a sound. There are songs that are to be sung through your life. Intercessors, there are sounds of heaven that are to be decreed through your prayers. Now, if you're not on the worship team or the intercessory team, don't sit back and say, Ooh, I'm good. Because people of God, there's a sound of worship that's to come out of your life and begin to affect your family. There are intercessions that need to begin to come out and begin to shift everything. There is a call to worship and intercede. And whatever we join ourselves to in a region is what gains strength. Hallelujah. So if you're on the worship team, I want you to stand up today. I know, she already told me she's the nursery. If she can't come, that's fine. Jenny, I want you to stand up too, right? Because you have a call to release the sound of heaven. You know it, right? Everybody knows it. Now, y'all may not know it, but... <laughs> 
I think I've prophesied it to you before, but there is a sound of heaven that's going to come through you. You're going to sing the songs of the Lamb. Amen. The rest of you, you're to, whether it's through your voice, whether it's through your instruments, you're to release the sound of heaven. So, Father, today, now just extend your hand. Extend your hand to those that are standing, okay? Father, today, we commission these worshipers. We commission, Lord, I just ask that you give them heavenly downloads of, of songs of the heavenly realm. Father God, creativity. Father God, skill. But Father, more than anything, anointing and presence. And Father, we break any assignment of the enemy that's tried to war over them and that's tried to pull anything away. But Father, we declare presence and glory and anointing over their lives. God, that they would sing the song of the Lamb, that they would release the sounds of heaven. Beautiful notes that would begin to be released. Beautiful notes that would begin to be released. Some that will be captured and written into song. And Lord, let us capture the sound of heaven and songs of deliverance. Lord, I prophesy songs of deliverance are coming out of this place. God, that there will be sounds of joy and freedom that begin to come out of this place and out of this city. Father, as people are set free from captivity, God, I declare over these next six months a great move of deliverance that's coming into this city, that's coming into this place. Father, workers of iniquity, Father, workers of iniquity who have, who have, have opposed the move of God, many knowingly, but many unknowingly. Father, I thank you that there's light shining in darkness. And Father, there is a spiritual dimension that's coming forth, breaking chains, and Father, setting people free who are coming into liberty. And Father, we're going to capture the sound of joy and freedom. Father God, thank you for the sound of joy and freedom that's coming forth into people's lives out of this city. Lord, teach us to capture it. Lord, I don't know what that looks like. I don't totally know what it sounds like. But, Father, I know what I see and what I feel. And, Lord, I thank you. And I thank you, God, that even others are going to start catching this sound. Father, there's a sound of awakening. There's a sound of deliverance. Father, songs of deliverance. God, I prophesy that this team and these musicians and uh, the, even others that couldn't be here today, they're going to begin to capture the sound of of the songs of deliverance and the unique sound that you want to come out of this house. It's going to begin to come out of this house and it's going to begin to come out of this city. So, Father, I pray that you'd set us all free. We'd all experience deliverance and freedom in our lives. So everybody else just stand up too. Father, we're just receiving what you're releasing today. Father God, we just uh, partner with the angelic. We partner with you. We partner with your Holy Spirit. We decree your word. Father, that that which you want to accomplish will come forth in our life. Lord, let the sound and the songs of deliverance. So, Lord, sing those things over us. Lord, sing those things over us, God. And you said that even the nations would begin to come and to sing and to worship and to intercede. You said that you'd bring intercessors from the nations. And Father, I thank you that even the things that have tried to stop that believing for the nations and that cross-pollination of the nations, Lord, I ask that those angelic beings that you've sent would come and break the chains of those things and facilitate what you want to facilitate. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for what you're doing today. Father, we join our faith to you, to yours. Lord, let the sounds of deliverance. Now, it's an intercession, you guys. There's something further that the Lord's birthing. Amen. There's a sound of songs of deliverance that you're releasing today, God. We birth it. Father, we call it forth. We ask for it today. Father, and I thank you that just as was prophesied at the end of worship... Lord, this sound's going to begin to start releasing encounters in people's lives. 
And Father, we make room for the encounters. Lord, you want to birth songs and sounds out of encounters. And so, Lord, we ask you to come in like a whirlwind. Lord, come in like a whirlwind and break those things, release those things that you want. God, we want to stir the sound of heaven. We want to stir the presence of God today, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we just call this forth. We decree this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Wow. So this week, go for the one thing. I know, you guys, there's so much going on. People are sick and we all have stuff to do, but steward and pursue and seek the one thing. And I know we all have stuff to do. Do what you have to do, right? It's just part of life. We got to work. We got to clean the house, right? We got to, you know, do your homework, all those things. But in the middle of that, take care of your children, all that. In the middle of it, (laughs) seek him and pursue the one thing. I just expect God to begin to do powerful things. One of the things I love that Brian and Jen Johnson out of Bethel said, they said that some of the songs that they wrote out of, out of that place where they said because of in their services, there was a freedom to sing the song of the Lord. Right. And songs got burst out of that. So we just further reaffirm we are a house of freedom, yeah. right, and that God can birth what he wants to birth, so praise God, have a great week, Supernatural School tomorrow night, I believe that God's just going to do this throughout the week, he's just going to take it higher next week, if you need a prophetic word, we'll have a prophetic team here to minister to you on this side, if you need a prayer for physical healing, And if God's saying that there are going to be songs of deliverance and freedom, I just believe that a lot of people are going to get healed. A lot of people are going to get healed in worship. We've seen that happen at times. I just think that's going to increase. But if you need prayer for healing, there will be a, for physical healing, there will be a team here. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Have a great day, great week, and we'll see you. God bless.